pathology. Today we are going to discuss a case of the posterior segment a patient with diabetic maculopathy. Before we start off, we'll just go through the pathology of diabetic retinopathy. You can see there's a junction between the arteries and the vein where the capillaries are formed. And here is actually where you get microaneurysms, which are a feature of exudative diabetic retinopathy. And these are actually the cause of the leakage. Fluid and heart and lipids leak out from these vessels, but the lipids are unable to come back because of the larger molecules. So they form cluster of hard exudates. It is important to remember that hypertension plays a very important role in these collection of hard exudate because they are easily pumped out with high hydrostatic pressures. So whenever you see a patient, you always look for their visual acuity. Here we saw the patient did not have a refractive error, but his visual acuity was 618 in both eyes and he had been complaining of decreased vision significantly more on the left than the right eye after having cataract surgery. She's been a diabetic for the last 15 years and hypertensive as well. She's a 50-year-old female. The anterior segment examination showed posterior chamber intraocular implanted on both eyes and macro examination showed few hard exudates and altered foveal reflex on the right side while there was extensive hard exudate formation on the left side. So we go through the clinical features on the slit lamp. So it's important to do all the examination features of the slit lamp. My aim is to teach you the slit lamp examination along with it as well. So here you can see I'm doing a diffusive elimination. So in the pupil, you're tending to get a jet or, or a jet black or a blackish pupil rather any greenish or yellowish appearance which you typically would get in patients with a cataract. So she is a hydrosudophagic patient. You do an examination of the lower palpebral conjunctiva by holding the lid downward. Here you can see these white dots. These are deposits of calcium which are called concretions, but they're covered with the conjunctiva. So there's nothing significant to be done for this patient. We need to know that quite a lot of the eyeball is covered by the lid. So we need to evert the lower lid to check for that area. And then we need to check for the punctum as well on the inferior side. So this covers, once you check for the palpebral, you also check for the bulbar conjunctiva. Similarly, you check the bulbar conjunctiva superiorly. So, once you've done your diffuse elimination, you would go in and do an examination of the other eye with a diffuse illumination. And this dis diffuse illumination would actually give you a gross idea of what is happening compared to while doing a slit examination. Here, then you turn on, increase your illumination, turn on the slit and increase your magnification to see the anterior segment. Here you can see checking for the depth of the angle at the so as most of the pseudophagic patients have open angles. Here you can see then you're checking for the anterior chamber depth in the center. The pupil is round and regular. This is retroillumination of the and of the of the lens in which you see a bright red reflex. What you want to see in pseudophagic patients if there's any uh, features of posterior capsular pacification, which is easily picked up on a retro illumination. The slit, the slit beam, when you're seeing this is going on to using a superfield lens to check for fundus examination under slit lamp. I wanted to show you the 90 diopter finding so you are uh, have an idea what you actually see and at the end, we'll also show you a fundus picture as well to give you a clear idea of the pathology. With a slit examination, usually the slit is smaller in size. The important thing to remember is that you're, what you're seeing is an inverted image. So this is the eye which you're seeing. This is the left eye of the patient. So this is the hard exudates which you see. 
They are a cluster of hard exudate. So they are present superior to the fovea and they are producing clinically significant macular edema because there was thickening plus hard exudate in this area. The cup to disc ratio seems to be about 0.7 in that eye. There seems to be uh, there are these blood hemorrhage in the supratemporal quadrant and then there are a few microaneurysm presence in the posterior segment. So 90D diopter examination, you need to push the lens or you need to place the lens as close to the eye as possible to get a good view and typically this is what you should be able to see. And this is the other eye, this is the right eye of the patient. Here you see if only a few heart exudates are present in the inferior part of the retina and the foveal reflex seems to be slightly altered in appearance. The cup to disc ratio and you can see the foveal reflex seems slightly altered. Uh, we'll have to check on OCT if there's any significant uh, changes at this level in the retina. But it's important to know that this is the type of uh, image you, which you tend to see in a 90 diopter lens, especially after a dilated pupil. And it tends to give you an overview of what the pathology is. And if you want to zoom in, you can check for that. But the important thing is it gives you a three-dimensional picture of the retina and you, this is the only test where you can find actually the thickening of the macula. If you do with checking with the direct ophthalmoscope, you cannot tell if there is thickening of the retina but if there is, you can check with a 90 diopter lens and have an idea about the thickening of the retina. Here is the left eye again and now we go on to see the OCT of this patient. Here you see the average thickness is 301 micron on the right eye and it is about 343 microns in the left eye. Here you can see the graph which shows the increasing thickness on this area. So this is about 320. So you can see wherever they are hard exudate, this purple area, this is telling you that the the retina is thicker in this area in this patient. So the inferior retina is involved in this patient, patient's right eye and it is the superior retina which is involved in the left eye of this patient. The fovea, uh, fortunately, is not that much. It's still in the green zone. So it's, um, uh, it's within uh, normal range, but it's the off-center retina that is more involved. Here you can see in the black and white picture as well that you can also see the hard exudates, inv involvement of the hard exudate in this area. And the other thing which is important to see, you need to look at this picture in which you see this colored plot of the retinal elevation or thickness of the retina. So the red would be a figure which tells you that there is thickening of the retina. So if you see these red hot spot in this area, that means that the inferior retina is involved. And similarly here, it's red and it has even gone beyond red that's become white. So that is an extreme case of retinal thickening in this area. So these are the plots which need to uh, see in patients with OCT of the macula. And the 3D plot here shows you that the retina is definitely elevated. Now looking at the detailed picture of the left retina, we find that the most significant finding are these hard exudates present in the superior retina and they are probably more or less confluent and when you see this OCT scan what you, what you want to see is I'll describe it as the patient has elevated foveal contour there is more thickening on the temporal side than the nasal side there is a whitish area which is rounded at appearance present in the subfoveal and temporal part of the retina, which is present at the level of the outer plexiform layer and the inner nuclear layer, and which is causing thickening of the retina. And there are also multiple hard exudates present in this area, which is outer plexiform and outer nuclear layer, and they are causing intraretinal fluid collection in, in the outer nuclear layer. The important thing is what you, what are these lines what you're seeing? These are shadows or shadows which you're seeing from the hard exudates which are looking white. The important thing to see in this patient is the IUS junction and the retinal pigment epithelium, the external limiting membrane all seem to be healthy. So the patient should have a good response to any treatment which you are planning for. 
because if these structures are affected and you cannot see clearly or, or these cells are damaged and the visual recovery is poor. So the diagnosis was left greater than right diabetic maculopathy. The left was more significant. So we are planning for the patient to have a left intravitreal injection of Davicizumab or Avastin 1.25 milligram. You can argue whichever injection you want to use. Either you can use Renibizumab, Aflibercept or Bavisuzumab. Probably considering the visual acuity or the, or, the, or the number of hard X days present, it is pretty exuberant amount. So if you discuss the usefulness of different injection, probably a flebercept would be the most uh, useful for these. But usually most economical injection for the patients is Bevisuzumab, so we plan Bevisuzumab for this patient. What Bevisuzumab is done is pseudophagic patient, so we need to go intra vitrally 3.5 millimeter behind the limbus and give 0.05 ml of the injection. And this injection would actually go and stabilize the leaky blood vessels. The question is, how many injections would this kind of a patient need? So this patient has got significant amount of hard exudate. So initially, we'll try a patient with bevisuzumab and probably first three injections are necessary at one month interval and then to reassess with an OCT scan. If the hard exudates are reducing and the thickness is getting better, we would plan for further injection. But if that is not happening, then we would consider changing the injection either to a ranibizumab or a flibercep. And even if those don't work, then intravitreal or suprachoroidal canacot is uh, the effective way of treatment because the patient is pseudophagic so intravitreal canacot uh, is quite useful if the patient does not have any history of glaucoma but this patient had a larger cup to disc ratio so we'll be probably more inclined to use a suprachoroidal canacot injection so once you've decided that and you've reduced the thickness of the retina, the next step in the end is you can do focal argon laser to area of microaneurysms where the thickness of the retina has decreased. So this is the discussion on diabetic macular edema. I think there are a lot of other points which can be discussed, but this was just to show you how you would see a patient in the outpatients and then make your logical decisions and move forward for treatment. Thank you very much and we'll be back with more videos for you.